there are a lot of myths that have grown up about, around the book, uh, The Feminine Mystique, which was published 50 years ago and made a tremendous impact. Uh, one myth, though, is that it started the women's movement, which it did not. Uh, actually, it was a book that didn't, I would say only about four pages in it were devoted to actual specific demands, the kinds that would be later raised by the, the women's movement. Uh, it was a consciousness raising book. Uh, some people call it the first self-help book for women. It spoke to women who had been told that they would find all of their happiness in through the achievements of their husband and their children. And Although they loved their husbands and their children, they weren't totally happy and they thought there must be wrong, something wrong with themselves. Betty Friedan said to them, in 400 really well-argued pages with example after example, there's nothing wrong with you. You're unhappy because society has forced you into a role that doesn't allow you to um, explore the full possibilities of your creative and intellectual and emotional needs. So that's one big myth. Uh, another big myth is that Betty Friedan told women to desert their families and run off and be careerists. Actually, um, Betty Friedan said that her epitaph should read that she made women and men better able to love each other because she allowed women to discover themselves so that they wouldn't nag their husbands and worry about them. She was also not a careerist. She told women that they needed to use their mind in meaningful activity. And she said sometimes it was better to do volunteer work uh, than to take a job just for the money. So those are some of the myths about uh, Betty Friedan and the feminine mystique. <laughs> well, I assigned that book to my class and soon regretted it because it's so out of date. Um, but actually, you can get a lot out of reading The Feminine Mystique if you understand that it's so out of date and why it was so needed. You know, that's what's stunning about it. The things that make it dated are what makes it important. In order to read that book, you need first to go back and realize what life was like for women there. Back in 1963, when if you wanted to work, you had to turn to the Help Wanted Female section of the Want Ads, where they could say things like, you must be really beautiful to get this job. Um, where a woman with a college degree, uh, working full-time year-round, earned less than the average man who was a high school dropout. Um, this was also a time period when homemakers, this is another myth about uh, feminism and, and Betty Friedan, the idea that homemakers were more respected and had more rights back before the feminist movement, not at all. Back in 1963, only eight states gave women any claim at all on the earnings of their husband. Uh, and uh, even the states that had community property gave the husband the final say over how it would be used, whether it could be disposed. He could actually give part of his uh, to someone else. She couldn't. Men could decide if she could take a job, if she could have a credit card. The man decided uh, where they lived. So if he moved and maybe you were a woman who had an aging relative and you didn't want to move, he could actually charge you with desertion and win a fault-based divorce. So it's so important to realize that this is a world that today's women can hardly even imagine, except for those who actually lived through it. And even those of us who lived through it, I think, have blacked out how bad it was. If you start with that, you can get a lot out of the book. Well, I think the changes are very, very important and significant and well nigh revolutionary. But uh, the fact remains that there are still prejudices against women. Um, usually the, the, the worst job discrimination and pay discrimination now kicks in at motherhood rather than just when they enter the workforce. Uh, it's women who are most likely to, to drop out of the workforce. But even if they don't, they face these tremendous prejudices. As soon as a woman becomes a mother, she is perceived by her employer as less competent. And we have um, study after study that shows that when women apply for jobs, the same women with the same qualities 
uh, if if the um, if the employer knows that one of them's a mother, they're less likely to be hired. If they are hired, they're hired at lower wages. So you have that continuing discrimination against women. I think that what we've discovered, uh, we've lost the old housewife mystique that said you're going to get all your satisfaction out of waxing the kitchen floor. But we've added two new mystiques. One kicks in very young. I call it the haughty mystique. The idea that now, yes, women are encouraged to do things that they were discouraged from doing in 63. They're not supposed to play dumb. It's, it's admirable for a, a woman to do good well in school or to be good at sports. Uh, so young women today are encouraged to take on a lot of activities that were traditionally denigrated for them because they were manly. But it's extremely important for them, much more important for them than it used to be, to demonstrate that they're sexually interested, sexually available, and hot. And this puts a lot of pressure on young women. I call it the haughty mystique. Then there's another mystique that kicks in not at marriage, but at motherhood. And that is uh, the supermom mystique. The idea that a real woman, a good mother, working or not outside the home, makes every moment with her child a teachable moment and you can never spend enough time with your kids. It's ironic because today's mothers, working mothers as well as stay-at-home mothers, spend more time interacting with their children than housewives did in 1965, the height of the male breadwinner family. And yet the motherhood mystique makes us feel constantly guilty that we're not giving enough time and attention to our kids. And it makes us neglect other parts of our lives, including our partners. Uh, in order to give that time and attention, when perhaps the kids would be a little better off being allowed to solve some of their own problems, the research suggests. Well, it's ironic that Friedan ignored African American and women of color because when she was a student activist at Smith, she was very, very involved. In fact, she helped organize a strike to support the higher wages for the housekeepers, predominantly minority housekeepers. Well, after she graduated from college, she worked for the union movement. She was very interested in, in. She was also a big proponent of desegregation and worked in her own community to integrate it. Um, but when she wrote this book, she very specifically targeted one particular group of women, um, white women with, who, it was kind of a new group, of uh, women who were going to college, who'd been told it was now okay to go to college the way it hadn't been for many years, once college was considered a radical thing that women shouldn't do. Now women in this post-war era were being told to go to college but they were also told that they should not use that education after college for anything other than to improve their, uh, their activities as a wife and mother. And some of these women were desperately unhappy. So that was her target audience. And I think that as long as we understand that was her target audience, we don't have to, to blame her. When I was researching my book, I found only a few African-American women who had read the book and liked the book. Most of them already knew that they would have to work. And one of the sad things about her failure to deal with African-American women in this book is that she could actually use them as an example of women who felt free to work outside the home even when they didn't have to. Uh, the, the black women married to the men in the highest income uh, distribution were the most likely to work outside the home because that was part of their cultural tradition that wives were uh, women were not only wives and mothers but community activists and co-providers for their family that um, that phrase co-provider was actually coined by the black movement not by the feminist movement so it's a shame that she left them out but I think in justice we need to say that she was targeting one particular women who were particularly confused not because they were more oppressed than black women or working class women, but because they knew they had these privileges and were still unhappy and didn't know why they were unhappy. Well, it disappoints me because um, Sheryl Sandberg's work, like Betty Friedan's, 
is really aimed at one particular target group of women. It is not talking to the secretaries and receptionists and childcare workers who are paid so little and the kind of people who don't have jobs where they are valued, where they can negotiate, where they have uh, promotion ladders. She's talking to women with enough education and privilege to be able to work their way into the top 20 or 30 percent, but who have not yet been able to work their way into the top echelons. And she's giving them some good advice about how to do it. Now, if that's all she did, and if that's all she focused on, and if she said that's the most important thing for anyone to do, I could understand the reaction. But she says explicitly, we have to work on two levels. Women, many women that I talk to, uh, many women uh, in this country do not have those resources. They are paid too low wages. All women need uh, subsidized um, parental leave. Uh, they need flexible work time. They need child care. She says, I have just chosen in this particular book, these are equally important tasks, but I have chosen to focus on the internal messages that women have received, that they've internalized, and that make it hard for them to move forward. In that sense, she's saying something very similar to Betty Friedan. Betty Friedan said, look, you have been fooled into thinking that a nice woman doesn't go out of the home and do any work. Sandberg talks to the, the daughters and granddaughters of the people Friedan was talking about, saying, well, okay, now you know that you should get an education and you should move out of the home and you should have a career, but you're still being fooled by getting these messages that nice women don't do the following things and by being attacked by the same kind of prejudices that if you do negotiate, you're seen as somehow less likable than a man who negotiates even harder than you. So her, she's aiming at a particular group of women. Her advice is uh, reasonable. It's not the solution for all women, but why in the world should we spend our time attacking her instead of the people who are keeping all women at all levels down? Well, I think it's been a contradictory thing. Um, one of the impacts of the women's movement has been to free women up to uh, enter important, uh, challenging, rewarding careers. And on top of that, uh, not caused by the women's movement, since the 1970s you've had a decline in real wages for most Americans that has increasingly made it necessary for women to go into the workforce. The incredible increase in the time that women spend at work has actually eaten into the time they spend in community activities. Most people tend to think that it's eaten into their time with kids, but as I said earlier, they're spending just as much time with kids as women did in 1965. What it's eating into is three things. One, house cleaning time. I don't think that's so bad, given the evidence that an overly clean house actually causes asthma <laughs> in kids. Uh, so I think that's a good one. Uh, but it, it eats into their uh, time with husbands, uh, or their partner, uh, which is a problem long-term for their marriage. Um, and most important, it eats into their time socializing, uh, doing community activity, doing volunteer work. Um, and that, and as a matter of fact, now we find out that single individuals, even working women, spend more time in community activities and caring for aging parents than married women because they are so pressed with uh, their jobs and their, their child rearing. I don't think the solution is to say, well, let's drive women out of the workforce and back into the volunteer world. But the solution is to actually look reality in the face and to say, look, 70% of American kids are growing up in homes where every adult in the household is involved in the labor force. We have an aging population where people need care. We have a frayed government social safety net. We can no longer depend on women to do this for free. We need to develop a new model for how that caregiving takes place. We need to integrate it with work life, and we need to make it an equal opportunity thing so that men as well as women can get involved in this kind of caregiving and social activity and community engagement.